Welcome to the IPFS Implementations Workshop. I'm B5 on the internet. Uh, I've been a member of the IPFS community for a number of years and uh, really excited to talk with all of you about uh, IPFS today. So when we're talking about implementations, I'm noodling on this a little bit before we had the uh, workshop. And I, I think there's been a fun framework to sort of use as a method of approaching the question of what an implementation is. And I think we can kind of break it down along three characteristics that are always present when we're talking about an implementation. We can think about languages, platforms, and use cases. And some of these terms are a little bit sort of um, vague and kind of on purpose. I think languages is pretty clear. We're talking about the classic programming languages, Go, JavaScript, Haskell, you name it. We talk about platforms. That's where we can get a little more uh, blurry. Uh, we can think of a browser as a platform. You can think about the command line as a platform. But you can also sort of drop that down a level and think about um, a specific browser engine as a platform. We can think about WebKit or Gecko or any or Servo, whatever browser platform you can think of. That too can be thought of as a platform. And then we get to use cases. This is sort of the space between applications and um, intended uses for a protocol. And I think that's intentionally large and intentionally sort of vague. We want to allow people to explore that space in a lot of ways. But I think this framework is really useful for thinking about an implementation because it gives a sufficiently broad definition to fit a lot of different things when we say the word implementation. We can start with a classic example, JS IPFS. If we just look at the, at the top line sort of description of JS IPFS from their website, you have a language, a number of platforms, and a suggestion of a number of use cases. The same thing can apply to a more discrete project uh, like Capiloon. Capiloon is an experimental user agent. To me, that's a platform um, that aims to give you what you deserve, privacy and control and freedom from constraints. In my mind, that's a use case. And I happen to know that Capiloon is written in Rust, which is obviously a language. Um, but I think that's a really useful framework for understanding how we think about uh, the sort of day-to-day -day operations of an implementation. And we will be talking about that a bunch today. But in addition to the sort of step-by-step -step implementations conversation, we have a, a broader sort of macro level conversation. And for that, I think that's why events like this are really exciting. It's a chance to sort of step back and say, hey, what are we really doing here? And I'm going to take a risk and try and do comedy in a room with no sort of reactionary space on the internet. And <laughs> we'll see how this goes. But to sort of set this tone for today, I want to tell you a story. And this is a true story. And it starts in 1983 on the MIT campus. In 1983, so a bunch of folks from MIT re received a $50 million grant. That is a large grant. That is $145 million if you live in 2022. It's a lot of money. That grant came from two organizations, the Digital Equipment Company, or DEC, and IBM. And this grant was uh, in the form of both hardware and actual funds. And it was for a project called Project Athena. And the goal of Project Athena was to bring computers to disciplines beyond computer science, which sounds a little bit sort of wild to our today years. But like at this point, computers are really only used in the computer science department at MIT. Nobody else had really sort of played with them. So if you were a social science student, you didn't use a computer. And this project was a massive undertaking to try and change that. The thing that they ended up making were rooms that look like this. In kind of, they can, Project Athena can kind of lay claim to inventing the computer lab. And along the way, there were a number of challenges to inventing the computer lab. Specifically, you have these two donation sources. You have IBM and digital uh, DEC both contributing uh, pieces to this platform. But MIT as a, as a faculty and an educational institution wanted a uniform experience for the students. They didn't want everybody to have to learn you know, the IBM platform and the DEC platform at the same time. And so there's a real like, how do we pull this off? And like the total bosses that they are in 1983, they say, okay, let's go Unix. Let's build a distributed system. This is gonna be great. I, I still, it still boggles my mind that 1983 people were like, yeah, let's go distributed. And we're still having these conversations today, but they tried it. And they invented what we now know today as the thin client model, um, where, you know, yes, our modern interpretation of that phrasing is not so great, but at the time, it's really interesting as the method of abstracting over DEC machines and IBM machines. So the general framework they were aiming for here was any student can go up to any terminal, be it IBM or DEC, and access their own files and be able to sort of have a uniform experience. But there's one problem with that approach um, at the time. How do you deal with the display? 
right? You want to use the display and the input from the keyboard, and you want to be sending that over a network connection to uh, a remote access machine. But like actually driving the display was a thing that hadn't really been conquered yet. There are other implementations, but nothing that was available to MIT that they could license. And so, like all good things, this there's a message just sent on a message board. And I'm actually going to break the rule of speakers and just read this to you out loud. Um, because this happened in 1983, and I think it's just this lovely piece of history. I've spent the last couple of weeks writing a Windows system for the VS100. I stole a fair amount of code from W, which is a prior Windows system, surrounded it with an asynchronous rather than synchronous code, and called it X. Overall performance seems to be about twice that of W. The code seems fairly solid at this point, although there are still some deficiencies we fix up. We're using, de we're using X. Everybody should switch. This is going to be awesome. It's not the ultimate Windows system, but I believe it's a good starting point. And at this point, there's an interface. And wait a second, hold on. If we can apply our framework, we can see there's a mention of languages, platforms, and use cases. There are applications that people are trying to use, um, and people are still begging for documentation. The bottom paragraph does kind of date this thing. Anyone interested in seeing a demo should come by this room, should call me on this thing first. And anybody who wants the code can come by with a tape which I think is just lovely. I want to go visit people with a tape to get source code. I think today's a little different. But aside from that, this kind of looks like a conversation that happens today. And I think in a lot of ways, this is setting the groundwork of culture as we experience it nowadays. But what came out of that ended up, be calling the, ended up, be, ended up being called the X window system. Logo came later, and yes, that's Emacs. And this was the mechanism for writing a platform neutral abstraction for doing displays over DEC and IBM machines. And this project goes well. It is really popular really early. Um, at this point, everybody starts using it inside of MIT and demand for it grows beyond the bounds of MIT. Uh, people inside of labs are using it and the, the software itself is gaining popularity. And to the point that in 1985, people get excited a number of implementations get written. We get one for the IBM RT PC, the DEC workstations, HP workstations, Apollo workstations, Sun workstations, the IBM personal computer gets an implementation. And all of this is because of a thing that was brand new to this project, which we now understand is the MIT license. And yeah, this project is actually kind of one of the precursors to open source. And I think, you know, if we take a very objective look at what that looked like at the time, it was a really exciting time for the X window project. They had funding in a use case, they got some code to work, they got a number of implementations, and they reached a degree of incumbency. And in 1985, it's like a really exciting position to be in for any technology. And so maybe that's the lesson, right? Open source is great, more implementations, better, the end. We should just stop there. Why even bother with the workshop? And I think this is the point that I'm trying to make with this story. This story is halfway finished. Where this goes from here is a really exciting sort of series of harrowing decisions that are of increasing risk uh, based on really smart guidance from a number of folks working on the X window project. In 1986, the DEC Western Digital Laboratory steps in. Uh, these folks are basically the A team of software at the time, or they were A and A team, depending on how you think about it. But they were really fantastic. They jump in chat and say like, hey, we want to rewrite X because we want to take it from version 10 to 11. We think we can make it a little more neutral. Sounds great. People from MIT are like, all right, sure, but you got to keep the license the way it is, and we're going to do this out in the open. And surprisingly, this phenomenal software team is like, yeah, why don't we just do this in a way where we can just have conversations out in the open about the design of the API? And MIT says, yeah, sure, let's do it. Flame emojis. X version 11 comes out, and as as much as things were great before, at this point, things really start to take off. It goes to the next level in every sense of the word. Uh, more than nine hardware vendors start building on top of this system. Uh, the X window system achieves a degree of popularity where it is not just the incumbent thing, it is the thing to build commercial products on top of. It is still licensed under the MIT license. MIT is still the steward of this project. It's so, scary to MIT at this point that they actually have like what we I think we now look back on as a moment of weakness. And they say, hey, we want to go give this this license to a vendor because this is just too hot to handle for us. And in one of the most incredible turns of governance I can think of, all of the vendors come back and say, 
Nell actually is, is better if a neutral party controls the actual project, which I think is just like an amazing moment in the history of open source. After that, more than 1,200, at one point, more than 1,200 employees are working on DEC, on X implementations at DEC. 1,200 people grinding on the X window system. Like, imagine that from back in the day. At this point, it's 2022. The X window system still exists. I checked the releases page on May 5th. Uh, where is it? No, May 3rd, there was an update to the lib. This project is still going. And I think that's just like an incredible story of like, at this point, it's reached the level of where it is like just assumed infrastructure inside of computing. And I think that's what's exciting here. You know, in 1985, these folks are thinking, wow, incumbency, that's incredible. And what actually ended up happening is this litmus scale goes from linear to log. And we have just an incredible series of events that happen that take the Exponential project into a whole new stratosphere. And in a lot of ways, is the first real large scale open source project. The way in which that that's precedent setting is incredible. And I think that's what I wanna remind us of as we go into today's workshop, is if we overlay this sort of as a template onto our ecosystem and think about IPFS, I think we're here. I think we're at a point where, you know, we, IPFS had funding, we had a working implementation, we have multiple implementations, it's fair to say that IPFS is the method of addressing off-chain data in Web3. In web and the future is unwritten. And I think for a lot of folks who you'll be hearing speaking today and a lot of folks in the ecosystem, this we don't really need to be told what it felt like to be sort of like the first people in open source because it's that scary feeling that we have today when we think about advancing such an incredibly uh, important project like IPFS. And what I'm here to tell you is we're gathered today to sort of try and understand where this could go. And this could go in a totally exciting and big light way. The best days of IPFS in so many ways could be ahead of us. And I think that's what's exciting. There's really, you know, we do have two frameworks that I think I'd like us to keep in mind as we look at today's talks. Uh, we have both the micro, which is sounds kind of like, um, I don't know, like it makes micro sound like it's less than the macro. I don't believe that at all. I think the micro is just the way that we walk our way through history. There's also the macro scale of things. And this like sustainability, collaboration, and governance, I think is a little underdeveloped. I'd love to sort of move that conversation forward as we work today. But for projects like this to work and for them to achieve this sort of great heights like the X window system did, it takes a lot of bold action and coordinated uh, behavior on the part of folks like us. And so with today's workshop, I'm really hoping that we can get into the weeds a little bit on this conversation. I hope that we can stay centered and think big and remember that we're all here to really advance incredible and exciting technology. So that we have a pretty solid schedule lined up for you today. All the hitters are here. Okay, a lot of the hitters are here. I, I would actually love even more folks to be joined in this workshop, but these are the folks that could join today. Thank you so much and thank you for joining.